Good morning. Welcome to Camarillo United Methodist Church. We are glad to be joining together in worship this morning. Um, always amazed uh, when we have uh, rain forecasts in Southern California because, you know, you just never know, right, in Southern California how bad it gets. And so um, the fact that you're here, you all receive like gold crowns or something, <laughs> right? Well, welcome. It's, it's, like I said, it's always a joy to come together in worship. Uh, we do want to be in prayer for those, of course, uh, weathering the, the Southern California um, storms uh, today and just to make sure that people are safe. As we come together, uh, as always, just want to remind you to fill out the back portion of, of your worship bulletin, uh, the connection card, uh, letting us know that you are joining us in worship this morning. Uh, even if you are a regular tender, to uh, at least write your name and turn that portion out and have it uh, ready to turn in with your uh, offering later on in the service. Great, greatly appreciate it. If you are new or if you're not a regular attender, we really appreciate if you fill out that um, connection card. It helps us to get to know you and to know that you are with us uh, this morning. And for those of you who are joining us online, um, well, bless it to, blessings to you, and I, I know some of you are, uh, are, are um, taking it safe uh, uh, on, with today's weather, uh, but I invite you as well to fill out the online connection card, uh, which is either on our church website or on YouTube. There's a link uh, to the connection, um, connection card, online connection card. Let us know that you're joining us in worship uh, this morning. And if you're new to our church this, uh, this day, uh, we expect extend a special welcome to you and hope you enjoy worshiping with us. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to in, uh, inquire, um, uh, learn more about the ministries of this church. You can visit us on our church website at camarilloumc.org or just inquire in the church office. How many guys are looking forward to Super Bowl? How many guys are looking forward to the Lunar New Year? Well, this year you have both uh, next week. And uh, as a way of celebrating uh, Super Bowl or Lunar, Lunar New Year, um, what better way is than to celebrate it with a bunch of egg rolls and fortune cookies, right? So the youth are pre-selling these items as part of their uh, youth fundraiser to fund the, um, uh, the, the Wesley Heritage Tour, that the, 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 the journey that they will be looking forward to uh, later on this summer. And so... Um, uh, the pre-orders uh, started last week, but you can order them uh, either go at our website or just look for one of our youth. Uh, you, you want to pre-order them because we do have limited amounts of uh, egg rolls as well as fortune cookies um, and have them ready for uh, next week. Uh, it will be available next week. We do want to uh, give thanks to Hillary and Stella Ling as well as George and Bonnie Ng. They're back there. Yay! They're the ones making over a thousand egg rolls. So yes, we have a whole bunch to sell. So, um, and as well as fortune cookies. So again, um, you can go to the QR code or the church website or just grab one of the youth in Brooks Hall. Um, and just let us know uh, so that we can make sure that you have your batch of egg rolls and fortune cookie for the Super Bowl. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, as you might have guessed, uh, but our youth car wash is postponed for another day. Um, that was a hard decision to figure out, should we or should we not? Should we or should we not? We decided, uh, you know, we'll, we'll postpone it. Um, and so we'll inform you when the next date is set. On Wednesday, uh, our children's ministry will have their monthly uh, workshop. Um, and that's at 3 p.m. on Wednesdays for our children. And then our men's group gather this Saturday at 8 a.m. for the men's breakfast. The speaker for this month, I believe it's Lanny Benny. No? That was last week. Who's this week or this month? Oh, Brian. Brian Lerns. Oh, okay. Brian. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, definitely looking forward to that. Um, Lent is, is less than two weeks. It actually begins on Valentine's Day uh, this year. Um, we do have an Ash Wednesday wo a worship service. It's a joint worship service with the three churches, the, the Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, and us Methodists, coming together to uh, worship together. It will be held at Mount Cross uh, this year uh, on Ash Wednesday, which is February 14th at 7 p.m. 
if you come, I may put the ashes in the shape of a heart for you. But um, it's a way to start the Lenten season. Uh, but also, uh, like last year, uh, we are doing an all-church study again. And so the books for the study are now available in the church office. It's called The Walk. Last year, we did The Way. Um, we might do Why next year. But anyhow, uh, this year is The Walk. And it's actually about the, uh, the five practices of Christian discipleship. And so, again, uh, the books are now available. We're always grateful to, for the gift of altar flowers. And today we have two arrangements. Um, the first arrangement is given by Lisa Karawaki in loving memory of her mother, Alice. And so um, we give thanks and may God continue to bless Lisa with many cherished memories of her mother. And then our second bouquet is uh, given by uh, Barbara and Stephanie Williams in honor of Richard Lester. So um, thank you, Barbara and Stephanie, for providing a beautiful arrangement today. Now, last but not least, today is the first Sunday of the month, and so if you are joining us in worship um, online, uh, please prepare a piece of bread and some juice uh, to participate in the sacraments later on in the service. With that, I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able as we continue in worship. I'm going to direct your attention to uh, our um, liturgist, uh, Paul Graham. The heavens shout of God's glory. Day by day, we are reminded of God's creative love. Day by day, we are blessed with the of God's glory. Come, let us praise the God of creation. Let us sing to the thanks of God. Please join in singing our opening song, Step by Step. The words will be on the screen. Sometimes it seems to be so close. You could touch it, but your heart would break. Sometimes the morning came too soon. Sometimes the day could be so hard. There was so much work left to do, but so
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you on this almost rainy day. Is it, going, is it, is it raining now? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a stormy day. Yeah, humid too. Well, you are the brave ones because you are here today. So thank you for coming and braving the storm. Um, so this week, I was thinking about a show that my kids used to watch on TV. It's called How It's Made. Have you ever seen that show? No, I'm not sure if it's on anymore. It was a, it is still on. It, it's a really good show. In every episode, they would pick one thing and they would tell you all about that one thing. It might be skateboards or potato chips or guitars or basketballs or robots. And they would tell you how it was, who invented it, where it came from and how it was made. They even had an episode on handbells. All right, so keep track of how many children's times I can work handbells into as an illustration. <laughs> a lot. Um, so I watched the episode about handbells, and it was pretty cool. Bells have been around like since the beginning of time, but handbells, like what we play at our church, were invented about 400 years ago. So what was happening 400 years ago? That's before there was a United States even. And they showed how they made them. So bells are made of bronze, which is a metal, and they take the bronze and they melt it. And to melt it, they have to heat it to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you imagine 2,000 degrees? And it becomes a liquid and they pour it into the sand mold and when it, when it uh, cools off, it's hard like this, and they take it out of the mold and then they tune it. They have to shave it here, shave it there in order to get it to be the right pitch and then they polish it up nice, and then you have a handbell. Oops, like that. Yeah, and they add the middle part, the clapper. That's the last thing they do, right? After they get it all polished and tuned, they put the clapper inside so that it makes the sound, and the handle. Uh-huh. Oh, what, what, what do they make with the handle? The handle is made out of plastic. So that also has a mold that makes it. All right, so actually my, my children's sermon is not about bells, so we're gonna move on from here, okay? <laughs> so, um, I think the reason this show was so successful is because people are curious. <coughs> we love to know, we need to know the answers to our questions, like how did something get here, or why does something exist, or how do things work? And you know, things like, why is the sky blue? Well, today it's not, right? <laughs> or why do we have fingernails? Or, or, or how did the earth get here? Oh, oh, ah, there's, there's, oh, they said that's easy. <laughs> um, there's lots of questions that we have, right? And 2,000 years ago or more, before the Bible was written, they didn't have shows that explained things, and they didn't have scientific equipment that could do tests and give you the answer to something. So thousands of years ago, when they had a question about how something worked, they had stories or myths that they would tell each other. Now, sometimes when you hear people say the word myth, they mean that something isn't true. But that is not the version of myth that I'm talking about. A myth is a story that explains something. Like, there are myths that explain how the world was created and why certain things happen. There are tales that explain the world and man's experience, or human's experience in the world. Thousands of years ago, people used these stories to explain things they didn't understand. And our Bible is full of stories that explain things, right? And today we're gonna to talk about one of them, uh, one of the stories in the Bible, it's actually in the very beginning of the Bible. It's on page one. Genesis one. And I think I have some pictures to show, here we go. And the Bible verse starts, in the beginning, God created, God created the heavens and the earth. So I brought some pictures of the heavens and the earth. Aren't those beautiful? Yeah, they're really cool pictures. And the world was nothing but darkness. So God spoke into the darkness and he said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw that it was good. And that was the beginning and the end of the first day. Next, God made the land. And then he carefully 
made the sky above the land. See, we've got the land and the sky in that picture. And he looked back at it and he said, yep, that looks good. And that was the second day. Next, God separated the waters from the dry land. And then he put plants all over the land. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? That looks like it uh, is the coast of California. And God looked at it and he said, ah, that's good. And that was the end of the third day. And then, next, God made the sun to light up the sky in the day and the moon to light up the sky at night. And he saw... Yeah, the sun and the moon in the same picture. Isn't that cool? Yeah, sometimes that happens. And God looked at it and said, yep, that's good. And that was the end of the fourth day. Then... God made all kinds of tiny little fish to swim in the shallow waters and big, huge fish to swim in the ocean. And if you look carefully, there are birds in that picture too. He made all kinds of birds, big and small and all different colors to fly in the sky. And when he was done, he looked at it and said, that looks good. And then that was the end of the fifth day. Then, what did God make next? All the animals. Can you see all those animals? Yeah. My gosh, it's there's not a. All of them. Not all of them. That's as many as I could fit on one page, though. That's a lot of animals, though, isn't it? Yeah, hippos. I see a bison. I see a lion. A panda. That must have been a very fun day to be God. Yeah? Yeah, look at all the cool things he created. But he looked at it and he thought, yeah, it didn't seem quite done yet. So he made one more thing. People. God decided to make people to enjoy his creation and to take care of it. And that was the sixth day. And after six days, the creation was all finished. So God took the seventh day to take a rest and to enjoy everything that he had created. So isn't that an amazing story? Yeah? Yeah? Were those pretty incredible pictures? Yeah. Yeah, I had a hard time picking all those pictures because there are literally millions of amazing pictures of our world, right? Where did you get them all? The internet. The other planets? Yeah, the story doesn't talk about the other planets. Maybe he made those when he made the heavens. I just said exactly what the story in the Bible said. I didn't add anything. So when I was picking out these pictures, like I said, I had a really hard time trying to decide what pictures to pick because our creation, God's creation, is incredible, isn't it? There are so many amazing things. There are so many things that it's awesome. Do you know what the word awesome means? Yeah. What does it mean, Elliot? Um, Good. Good. But even more than good. Ollie. Great. Yep, even more than great. Enjoyable. Enjoyable. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think, to me, The word awesome means all those things. It means something so good, so amazing, that it takes your breath away. Have you ever had anything take your breath away because it was so amazing? I think that's how our planet is. And I think this story in the Bible, this creation story, is there to help us remember to appreciate the beautiful creation that's around us. To stop every day and remember how amazing this world is to take time to appreciate the beautiful sunsets and sunrises, the beaches and the majestic mountains we have, the waterfalls and the volcanoes, the rain and the sun, and to appreciate what amazing power it took to create this world. What an amazing God we have, right? So if we want to talk about it more, we can talk at Sunday school, but right now we're going to say a prayer. You ready? Can you pray with me? Awesome God. Awesome God. You are amazing. You are amazing. Your creation is awesome. Your creation is awesome. Thank you for the earth and everything in it. Thank you for the earth and everything in it. Help us to be good caretakers of your creation. Help us to be good caretakers of your creation. And to care for your earth as you care for us. 
care for your earth as you care for us. Amen. And so I wanted to invite up Glenn and Cheryl Nelson. And so I can introduce them to our, our church family. So welcome, Glenn, and welcome, Cheryl. So this is uh, Glenn and Cheryl Nelson. They come to us from uh, down south uh, by Orange County, um, Huntington, Huntington Beach area, a community United Methodist Church of Hunting, Huntington Beach. And so uh, they came, um, uh, they were referred to our church by the pastor there. Um, he's a good friend. But yeah, he <laughs> told, told them, hey, come to this church. This is a, a wonderful church, and they've been coming for a few months, and uh, have been um, enjoying the church, I'm assuming, <laughs> because they decided to join. So we are um, glad to have them um, come and join us. Uh, Cheryl is a former educator, and Glenn is a former law enforcement. You guys can ask them all the stories. But at this time, as they come, uh, they are transferring their membership, uh, and so I'm going to um, ask them the, uh, the membership vows. So, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your powers to strengthen its ministries? And if so, please say, I will. And as members of this congregation, the Camarillo United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if so, answer by saying, I will. All right, and then for all of us to respond back, Members of the household of God, I commend Cheryl and Glenn to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their love, and perfect them uh, in love. And we respond with the, the words on the screen. Let us all respond together. We give thanks and welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Cheryl and um, Glenn, we welcome you. And we have coffee mugs to stay awake. No. Um, and, and to remember that you're part of this family now. We welcome you. And so let's welcome them. And I, and I have asked them uh, today, uh, as we uh, um, observe and celebrate Holy Communion, they will be uh, assisting me in Holy Communion later on in the service. So welcome. So this Saturday is movie... Well, this Friday, that's why I have Christy. Um, this Friday, the, uh, the children's ministry or the family ministries uh, is having movie night. And they're uh, watching a movie called Day... Yes, day. yes day. It's a day when everything is yes. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, so again, um, it's not just for children. It's for children and adults. So come and join in. Uh, I'm sure the rain will have stopped by then. And so... Um, it's on Friday at 6 p.m., 6 to, and Christy will be providing hot dogs and chips and all the goodies to enjoy that evening, all right? So that's this Friday at 6 p.m. come to a time in our service uh, to lift up prayers for our world and our communities around us. Uh, just a quick announcement that uh, Philip Jones, uh, who passed away last Saturday, um, his memorial service is scheduled for this coming Saturday, February 10th, 
at 10 a.m. So uh, keep that in mind, and we invite you to come and celebrate uh, Philip's life. Um, and as we do, as we do uh, look forward to that celebration, um, we pray for God's uh, peace and strength to be upon the family as they prepare for uh, Philip's memorial service. Now let us all join, join together in prayer. O God of all creation, we give you thanks, O God, as we come together this morning, uh, whether in person or online, to be in your presence, to give praise and thanksgiving to you, O God. Even in the midst of rain, we gather to worship, for you are the creator and the source of all life. You created the heavens and the earth, and your spirit swept through all creation to give it life. In you, O Lord, there is joy, there is hope, there is peace and love that is experienced through all of life's experiences. We give you thanks, O Lord, that each time we come together before you in worship, we are reminded of your presence and who we are as your children. As we come to celebrate this week, we also come seeking guidance and encouragement as we face life's struggles each and every week. We continue to pray for peace, to be known throughout the earth. May your spirit guide our world leaders in seeking peace, O Lord. Give strength to the weak and compassion to the strong. May we work together in building your kingdom. We also lift up prayers for our community, which will be facing severe storms throughout the nation this week, O God. Keep people safe, O Lord and be with those in need of shelter. Provide the resources we need to assist those in harm's way. We continue to lift up prayers for those within our church. Be with the family of Philip Jones as they prepare for his memorial service this weekend. Grant them strength as they cherish the memories we hold of him. May we cling to your promise of resurrection and eternal life as we lift up Philip into your eternal care. We also lift up prayers for Richard Figueroa Bajaras' father as he is in hospice care. Grant him strength, O Lord, and surround him with great care caregivers to provide the care in which he needs. Provide him with comfort and peace as he waits his final days. And we lift up prayers for Ethan Quintana, Stacy Hall's son, as he is being seen by doctors right now, God, after another um, seizure. Lord, we pray for your healing presence and your healing hands to be upon him. Embrace him, O oh God, and be with the family as they care for him. And, and we ask that the doctors find ways to, to relieve of his seizures. Lord, there are so many prayers that we hold in our hearts. You know them, O oh God, even before we can voice them. Receive them, O oh Lord, as we, lift, as we lift up each and every one of our cares to you in silence at this time. God of peace and of mercy, be with us as we continue to strive in living according to your ways. Grant us strength in caring for others. We rejoice in the community of faith that you have provided where we can come together to grow in faith. We thank you for new members that join our church today. May your spirit guide them in finding their place and ways to be in ministry with you. Be with us all that together we strive in building your kingdom here on earth. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward as we um, give thanks to God for all the ways in which God blesses us. And so with hearts of gratitude, so we take this time to give of our tithes, gifts, and our offering. God! my feet 
God of grace and forgiveness, you who gave everything and spared nothing to make us your own, we offer back to you what you have given so freely to us. May these gifts be pleasing to you and serve to spread your love. Amen. We have two scripture readings this morning. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Listen to the opening words of the Bible and the story of creation. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God spread over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. The second scripture passage comes from Psalm 19, verses one through five. Listen to the confession of the psalmist telling of God's handiwork in all creation. 
The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of the Holy Scripture. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Most gracious, loving God, we give you thanks as we come together and reflect upon the passages that we have just heard. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit be upon us as your Spirit swept through the waters and filled the void and gave life to all that you have created. May that Spirit speak to us now, O oh God, fill our hearts and our minds and our ears that we may be receptive to you. We pray, O oh God, that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there's a story, well actually it's more like an account, uh, an account of a group of fifth and sixth graders who uh, were asked to describe how the world works. It's almost like what uh, Christy was saying, you know, there's that show, How, how Things Work. Um, and to define, you know, some things uh, in our world scientifically. And so when asked about how they would describe the law of gravity, one child wrote, no fear jumping up without having to come back down. That's pretty good, okay. Another question posed to them was to describe how thunder works, right? And one child explained, you can listen to thunder and it tells you how close you came from being hit. <laughs> if you don't hear it, you got hit. So never mind. <laughs> A couple of them discussed the role of clouds. And one student commented, I'm, I'm not sure how clouds are formed, but clouds know how to do it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> right? That's important. Um, and I like that because, you know, we might not know how things work in the world, but nature surely does, and, and that's the important thing. Another sixth grader uh, described rain, and she said, water vapor gets together in a cloud. And when, when it gets big enough to be caught a drop, it does. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, one last one that I want to share. One child asked, when planets run around and around and around in circles, we call them, they are orbiting. But when people do that, we say that they're crazy. <laughs> so insightful, aren't they? And true. <laughs> well, it's fun to try to explain how the world works. And science helps us try to explain how things work in our physical world. But as we continue in our, sermon, um, in our series, right, sermon series, Wrestling with Faith, uh, for many people, science and faith tend to be at odds with one another. Some people have argued that in order to, to truly believe in faith, you have to almost keep science at an arm's length. It's almost, a, it's almost as if you need to kind of park your brain at, at the door of the church if you want to be a faithful Christian. Well, as many of you know, I love science. Right? My undergraduate education was in engineering, and I took every single science course in high school and in college. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to make that choice. Right? You don't have to choose between faith and science. You can be a thinking Christian and not just rely on blind faith. In fact, you don't want to have blind faith. You want to have faith that is logical and rational. So, one of the common areas of contention that many people ha have be between science um, uh, and what we read in the Bible is, of course, the account of creation, right? the creation story in the book of Genesis. Now, a, a, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at you know, how we are to read the Bible and, and make sense of it. The Bible is not some science textbook. 
And so understanding it means studying the history and the context of when it was written, who was it written to, and why was it written, understanding the context of it. And learning about the context also means understanding the metaphors and the symbolisms behind the writings and not just take it literally. After church uh, that, that Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Steve Kunkel, is he here? I think he, uh, he might be at home being dry. Um, Steve Kunkel came up to me and asked, have you heard the biblical theology based on the first two chapters of Genesis? And I asked, huh, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you read the first two chapters of Genesis, you realize that the Bible can't be read literally because the two creation stories, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, they're two separate creation stories, and those two accounts are completely different. In fact, the order of creation is different in those two. It's as if the biblical writer, the authors, intentionally put these two stories together in the very beginning of the Bible to say, don't read this literally, right? And don't get caught up in the minute details that detract us from the deeper meaning behind the stories. So if you look at it, Genesis 1 is a beautiful, beautiful story. It's written in poetry. It's more like a hymn or a litany to be used in worship rather than a science book. It tells of the beauty and the wonders of the world, not necessarily the mechanics behind it. In contrast, Genesis 2 is written in prose form, and it tells, it reads like an, an old folk tale about, the, about a loving, caring God that takes the time to carefully mold the very first human being. Again, it's not, it's not a medical journal of how our bodies work. These are testimonies of the writers who tell us something about their faith in God. But if we, read, if we try to read those stories literally, it's going to be challenging. It's going to, challenge, it's going to be challenging to reconcile what it says with science. Again, the, the verses you know, that we read, that, that we read today, you know, about the day and the night being formed, you know, the day and the night was formed even before the sun and the moon, right? How does that work? It's backwards. There's, there's, there's a sea of water that, that, that floats above the sky, if you really read it literally. And the plants were formed before the sun. So again, you cannot read this literally. It just doesn't make sense that way. Either that or you have to reject science. There was a college student uh, from USC uh, who was a biology major. And in one of her conversations with, with um, fellow Christians in her Bible study group, one of her friends told her that she shouldn't believe in evolution because that's contrary to the creation story. And so she called up her home pastor and asked, do I have to choose between the Bible and believing in evolution? And thank goodness, her, her pastor said, no, you don't have to choose because they actually work in conjunction with each other. Who is to say that evolution isn't one of God's tools for, for creating, for making, uh, bringing the world to come about? On Christmas Eve of 1968, more people heard the verses of Genesis 1 than any other time in history. Do you guys remember that day? Christmas Eve, 1968. Some of you guys were around, right? Not all of us, but still, some of you, right? But that day was when Apollo 8 traveled to the moon and orbited for the first time. You guys remember this? Right? It orbited the moon for the first time in human history. And as people around the world were glued to their, to, tuned in to their radios or their TV to listen in to that broadcast. The crew of Apollo 8 decided to read from Genesis 1. Here's a video clip of that broadcast. We are now in the 
now approaching uh, lunar sunrise. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. It's kind of hard to hear because that was, you know, technology back in 1968. But if, if you listened, you know, this is the, the crew of Apollo 8. And of all the things that they could have said or shared with the world that were tuning in that day, they chose to read from the Bible. Genesis 1. Why? Why would they do that? Well, apparently there, 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 there was actually a lot of thought put into that broadcast. And um, anytime, you know, anytime that someone came up with some, some writing or something to say, they said that they, they felt it was inadequate or inappropriate or even corny. But then someone down at Mission Control, um, it was actually someone's wife uh, down at Mission Control, suggested that they, they read from Genesis chapter 1. And it was magnificent. Over a billion people spread across 64 countries listened to that reading that day. The following year, in 1969, Apollo 11, you know, the lunar module, landed on the moon. Now, we all know of that, what, that story, right? About what uh, Neil Armstrong said when he stepped off the lunar lander. We know that, right? What did he say? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Right, we all know that. But what a lot of people don't realize is what happened right before stepping off the lander. Buzz Aldrin wanted to commemorate that special moment. And you know what he did? He took out a piece of bread and wine, and he shared it. He partook of the very first Holy Communion on the moon. Did you know that? And then he read these words from Psalm 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? That's from Psalm 8. He read that. Buzz Aldrin, you know, he's one of the great astronauts. He, he was an engineer. He knows a lot about science. You know, he's the second person to step, off the, step, uh, step, step foot on the moon. And yet, when he came to an experience that awesome, that awesome moment, he doesn't talk about how great he is or, oh, yeah, the, the atmosphere here is, I don't know, and, you know. He doesn't talk about that stuff. He realizes how small human beings are in contrast to all creation. He wanted to just burst out in praise of God. Another astronaut, Jim Lovell. You guys know who that is, right? Apollo 13. Maybe many of you probably know that, uh, played by Tom Hanks, right, in the movie, Apollo 13. He said, after he returned, before the flight, he said this, quote, before the flight, I was really not a religious man. I believed in God, but I really had nothing to share. But when I came back from the moon, I felt so strongly that I had something that I wanted to share with others, that I established what he called high flight in order to tell all men everywhere that God is alive, not only on earth, but also on the moon. That was Jim Lovell. I can tell you from my own experience, you know, my own personal experience of studying science, 
that you don't have to park your brain at the door when you come to church and believe in God. And you can, you, and I can tell you stories of famous astronauts about their faith. But there's one other person that I really, really, really want you to hear from. I want to hear, I want to share with you a testimony of whom I would consider one of the greatest scientists of modern times, Dr. Francis Collins. He recently retired from being the director of the National Health Institute, or National Institute of Health, right, NIH. Um, he was the longest serving director of that institute, serving over three uh, presidents for 12 years. NIH is the largest medical research institution in the world, employing over 20,000 employees, you know, 6,000 researchers, with a budget of over $40 billion. So this Dr. Francis Collins, he's no dummy. He's a smart guy. For people who don't know Francis Collins, I usually tell them, he's actually, he was Dr. Um, Anthony Fauci's boss. You know Fauci, right? Francis Collins was Fauci's boss. I met Dr. Um, Francis Collins several years ago when I was in San Diego because he came and did a lecture about faith and religion. And I want to share with you his testimony. And I hope this comes out clear. Beginning with the reason that I'm here tonight, let me say something about the perceived disharmony between science and faith. Nearly six in 10 adults in the US say science and religion frequently conflict. Well, that was certainly my view as I was growing up in Virginia without much of a spiritual perspective, but falling in love with the scientific method. Faith seemed to me to be the antithesis of the rational scientific approach that I wanted to pursue. And so I migrated without much thought about it into agnosticism and ultimately atheism. But then I moved from quantum mechanics to medical school and the questions of the meaning of life and the reality of mortality were impossible to ignore. Science didn't help me much here. I was surrounded by patients and some of my professors for whom faith provided a way to wrestle with those profound questions. That was puzzling. Challenged by one of my patients to describe what I believed about God, I realized my atheism was dangerously thin. Seeking to prop this up, I began a journey to try to understand why intellectually sophisticated people could actually believe in God. And to my dismay, I found that atheism turned out to be the least rational of all the choices. To quote Chesterton, atheism is the most daring of all dogmas, for it is the assertion of a universal negative. Scientists aren't supposed to do that. Over a two-year period, with much help from wise mentors and the writings of C.S. Lewis, I slowly and rather reluctantly came to the conclusion that belief in God, while not possible to prove, was the most rational choice available. Furthermore, I saw in the very science that I so loved, something that I had missed, the evidence that seemed to cry out for a creator. There is something instead of nothing. The universe had a beginning. It follows elegant mathematical laws. And those laws include a half dozen constants that have to have the exact value they do, or there would be no possibility of anything interesting or complex in nature. God must be an amazing physicist and mathematician. But would he or she actually care about me? The major world religions seem to say yes, but why should I trust that? And then I met the person who not only claimed to know those answers and to know God, but to be God. That was Jesus Christ. I had thought he was a myth, but the historical evidence for his real existence was utterly compelling, including his life, his death, and yes, even this, his resurrection. And as the truth of the New Testament sank in, I realized I was called to make a decision. In my 27th year, I could simply not resist any longer. With some trepidation, I dealt, knelt in the dewy grass on an October morning somewhere in the Cascades 
and I became a Christian. Friends in whom I confided my newfound faith predicted this would be short-lived. After all, I was by then a physician who was interested in studying genetics. Genetics means DNA. DNA means evolution. And by then, I was convinced that evolution was not only just a theory, it was supported by evidence that made it about as compelling as gravity. Surely, they said, my head would explode when the conflicts emerged. But that never happened. Um, Francis Collins, he, uh, he not only was the director of NIH, but he's actually the, the scientist that mapped the human genome. So basically, he's the, um, he's the main scientist who developed the genetics, the human genetics, not, not Mendes, Mendelssohn, but Mendel, but um, the human genetics. Someone like that, someone like that comes and knows and comes to faith. This video clip was actually taken from a longer uh, clip where he talks about the harmony of our world. And I probably want to share that video um, at the discussion group later on after the service. But I gotta say, if a person like Francis Collins can have a deep faith in Jesus Christ while being the most brilliant scientist, then I'm pretty sure that we can reconcile any challenges that we have between science and religion. So to the question, are faith and science compatible? I realized from last week that I need to answer the question directly or else people misunderstand. So to the question, are, are faith and science compatible? Yes, very much so. We can be faithful Christians believing in the faith traditions and the stories while being critical thinkers in our modern world of science. Amen. With that, I'm, we come to this table. Again, this very table where, as I shared with you, it signifies such a connection with the Almighty that Buzz Aldrin, the thing that he did, before stepping off onto the moon was to observe Holy Communion. I invite you, um, there are, um, I guess, uh, pamphlets or, or little cards in the pew pockets that have the litany for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life to the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from the captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, your, our light and our salvation. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so on the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke it, and then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and then gave it to his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in, my, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Christ Jesus, 
we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that we may be the, the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. And so with the confidence as children of God, let us all join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just want to remind you that in our United Methodist tradition, we observe uh, op what is known as open communion, which means that you do not need to be a member of this church or any church, or you actually don't even need to be baptized. Everyone is welcome to come and participate and partake of these elements because these elements of the body and the blood of Christ is a symbol, a reminder for us of the love of God, the grace of God that is offered to us without any restriction or without any hindrance. And therefore, everyone is welcome to receive the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Come and receive the elements. Mm -hmm.
Let us all join together in the prayer following communion as found on the screens. <laughs> Let us all pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able uh, as we sing together our closing song, Over My Head. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere over my head. seated we have uh, just one more quick announcement or, or recognition and um, yep or I have a microphone right here okay. Helen thank you I'm Helen Fall I'm the president of the United Women in Faith given we give each year a special mission award it's given to those who have provided outstanding service in our church. Today, it is my pleasure on behalf of the women in faith to honor Stella Ling and Hillary <laughs> Ling. If they would come forward. Wow. 
now. <laughs> you help me. I was meant to be a surprise, and I knew they'd be here today because it's Communion Sunday. So I asked if I couldn't do it on this special day. Stella Ling is very active in communion stewardship, and Hillary carries that camera everywhere. <laughs> I, <laughs> I saw him even taking pictures as we were honoring him. <laughs> it's my pleasure to give you this pen in honor of your service to the church. Thank you, my pen. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Amen. We are always grateful for all the volunteers. Uh, in fact, the church can't function without volunteers and, and supporters and and of course, we are grateful to God for uh, Stella and Hillary, who are uh, supportive and volunteers for everything. Again, every uh, first Sunday, um, Stella and Hillary come, and Stella's the one that makes sure we have enough bread, her cups, and she has to fill those little cups, and all of that. So we give thanks. As we go forth, may you go in the confidence of God that in the world around us, Everywhere, there is a witness that God is present, God is with us. That in all of life, through all the ways we explain how life works, God is behind it all. So go forth and praise God. Give thanks to God for the life that we live. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.